Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our second panel of the conference, which will now focus on a different topic. We addressed before the challenges for European defence, and now we will focus on building a new European defence identity. So welcome back. Um, I hope we can be as uh, brief and stick to the schedule as excellently as in the first panel. I will do my best. <laughs> So let me uh, introduce you our panelists. We will be joined by the fifth one uh, later on. So we'll start without him. Uh, right next to me, we have Daniel Fiot from the EU Institute for Security Studies. Then we have Professor Jolion Howarth. Um, he's a Jean Monnet Professor for European Politics at Personam and Emeritus Professor of European Studies at the University of Bath. Welcome. Uh, our distinguished guest in the middle is Radmila Shekirinska, uh, Vice Prime Minister and uh, Minister of Defence of the Republic of Macedonia. We are very glad you could join us. Welcome. And next to her we have um, Vice Admiral Emil Eftimov, Deputy Chief of Defence here in Bulgaria. A very warm welcome to all of you. And we will be joined later on by Ambassador Philip Rieker from the US State Department. So, I suggest we'll start immediately with your presentations, and especially with you, Daniel. Uh, please try to all stick to 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, I will keep watch, I will also be checking my phone, but I think we will manage it. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone, yes, it's working, okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to the conference. <coughs> First time in Sofia for me, so I feel very honored that uh, I'm here in, uh, for this conference and in such a uh, distinguished panel. Um, uh, as was rightfully said, I'm representing the EU <coughs> Institute for Security Studies, uh, which for those of you who don't know, uh, is an EU agency uh, with the task of <coughs> stimulating and supporting the reflection on the EU CFSP and CSDP. Um, let me begin my presentation by perhaps um, taking off my defense hat and trying to put on my amateur sociological hat or sociologist hat uh, to really think about what we mean uh, when we talk about the word identity. Because identity, of course, is a contested uh, uh, word, concept, and it can mean many, many things. Right? Uh, in our own personal lives, we think about uh, our own identity, sometimes our nationality, our interests, our, our you know, emotions, the myths which make up our uh, personal identity. And so, of course, to try and translate that to uh, the international level can sometimes be problematic. But as many of the speakers have already said uh, today, uh, I think it's very timely that we do indeed speak about identity. Uh, and many of the reasons have already been uh, very well elaborated, I think, in, the, in panel one. Uh, what do we mean when we speak about an EU defense identity today? Well, in terms of self-understanding, of self-critique, of our own identity and our relationship with the world, that seems to be a lot clearer uh, in the recent years. Of course, uh, we see quite clearly with the EU global strategy in 2016, a very uh, determined and I would say very intelligent uh, understanding of the world uh, in terms of the threats and crises which Europe faces, but also not just the strategic understanding of the world, but also where do we go? So for the first time at the EU level, I would say, we have a willingness and an ambition to move from what the High Representative and Vice President Federica Mogherini usually calls from vision to action. And of course, action is also a very important part of identity. What do we want to do in the world? So the global strategy is, is an extremely important document in terms of our understanding collectively of Europe, as Europeans. On the action side of things, also we move quite uh, much further forward. Uh, for the first time in many, many years, we say with quite a lot of confidence at the EU level that strategic autonomy should be a goal for the Europeans. Now, of course, strategic autonomy is also a contested concept. Uh, it can also be sensitive. But in, in essence, it means two things, at least in my mind. The first, Europeans have to be able to act militarily on their own, if needed, and for the obvious reasons that were discussed in panel one, but also to make the Europeans, the European Union, a much better partner for organizations and partners such as the US and, and NATO, of course. 
So that's very, very important. Uh, more on the action side of things. Uh, we don't just have a document in the global strategy, but we have, as has already been mentioned uh, this morning, a number of concrete policy uh, initiatives. Uh, the coordinated annual review on defense, uh, the European Defense Fund, I might also add, which hasn't been mentioned here, but has a, I would say, a growing significant relevance for the operational sphere, also the establishment of a command center, or the uh, so-called MPCC, the Military Planning Conduct Capability. Uh, and also lastly, uh, but not uh, uh, by no means to diminish it, permanent structured cooperation, which is also important. So we see in the space of, uh, by my calculations, 19 months since the publication of the uh, global strategy, quite clearly a move from the vision to the action. And of course I say this uh, with all of these new initiatives on the table, to also say that we're still at a very early stage in many of these initiatives. Uh, the Defense Fund has already started to be used for defense research projects. So for the first time we see European money from the EU budget being used on quite sophisticated technology areas to improve um, not only the technological base in Europe, but also to improve our strategic autonomy overall. So money is flowing there into projects which should make a difference to or put meaning into the idea of strategic autonomy. As was also said this morning, uh, we're still at a very early stage on the capability development side or the capability window of the Defence Fund. There are still negotiations uh, going on in the trialogue format. And hopefully the aim is by the beginning of next year that we have as an experimental uh, pot of money or phase uh, up to 2020, about 500 million to start investing in capability development which of course is also a major, major departure point for the European Union to start spending money on capability development. Uh, this of course all forms part of the notion of identity because uh, if I take the defense fund in particular, uh, this is not just a question about putting money on the table. It's not just a question of investing money into capabilities into research. Actually, if you look at the fund, the most important aspect of all of this is the question of strategic prioritization. Where should the money go to? What are the European priorities when it comes to research and capability development? So I would also say that uh, the question of EU defense identity, the movement from vision to action, also comes with some extremely sensitive but also interesting strategic questions which perhaps the EU has never really had to confront in the same way before. What do you want to spend your money on? Can we have an agreement between the member states on where that money should go? What is the European Union's notion of defense in the future? There was some mention uh, this morning of hybrid, of the AI revolution. We need to think seriously uh, at the EU level about what type of conflicts we could potentially be involved in in the future. Uh, would we have the political willingness uh, to engage in those types of conflicts? So, overall, we have, I think, at least on the question of strategic prioritization, somehow also matured with some of the new initiatives. And, of course, the coordinated annual review on defense is also extremely important here. Because, again, we have, for the first time, another initiative flowing directly from the global strategy, a recognition that if strategic autonomy is to actually mean anything in reality, then the member states have to give up their past forms of behavior, and by that I mean planning only on a national basis for their defense. Uh, this clearly will not do anymore in the European Union. There's not one state that can afford now and in the future to plan on their own. So the, uh, the idea is a collective understanding of defense, a collective understanding of what capabilities we will need in the future and how we wish to fund them, and also in which conflict areas do we think the Europeans are best suited or have their key strategic interests? So this is also very, very important. And then finally on the initiatives, PESCO. What is the point of PESCO uh, if it doesn't lead to what the uh, treaties quite clearly articulate is supposed to be a common defense, a European common defense policy? Uh, that clearly was not put in the treaties very, very lightly. It's a very, very ambitious goal, very, very ambitious target. I take the reading of the 25 member states that 
signed up to PESCO to mean that they understand fully the obligations that are implied with PESCO and where that may lead in the future. Now, as I said, with PESCO, we're still at a very, very early stage. You know, confidence with each other, building trust between member states, planning together, doesn't come naturally, even though we're supposed to have been doing that for many, many years. So we're entering a new phase now where uh, there is a lot of, the, at least the frameworks which we have developed, should lead to this, uh, I, I dare to say the word narrowing, but a, a kind of increasing uh, unity of purpose, both on what capabilities we develop, where we're likely to be in terms of the uh, level of ambition for European defence, operationally as well, uh, and also collectively how we understand uh, our strategic environment. Now, uh, let me end with a few points uh, related again to the idea of identity. As I've said, it's about uh, you know, your self-perception, your emotions, the relationships you have with people. But of course, we all know as well that with identity, there is such thing as an identity disorder, which you know, some people can also call schizophrenia. Uh, <laughs> we also have to keep this in mind as well. I think on this basis, there are at least three forms of schizophrenia which we need to think about. Uh, the first one quite clearly relates to the relationship between the member states, the EU member states, and the EU uh, as a set of institutions and as a political project. The schizophrenia between national prerogatives and a more EU-based uh, identity or focus uh, is still not there, quite clearly. Uh, nations still plan on their own, uh, uh, largely. So the reaction is still not, even with the new initiatives, for member states to cooperate with each other. Uh, we see quite clearly in the documents a call for strategic autonomy, but I would say it is perhaps equally important to think of the notion of strategic solidarity. And this is really the core of this. Uh, what are the member states willing to do with each other in terms of their own individual, national, and even regional sometimes, uh, strategic perceptions, which can be very different, let's be honest, in the European Union. Uh, the second form of schizophrenia, which needs to be kept in mind, of course, is the NATO and EU relationship. We've had a lot of good work, I think, on uh, the joint declaration from 2016. Uh, there's quite clearly a step uh, uh, change in that relationship in terms of the uh, number of action points and working projects which have been uh, developed together by two organizations. But clearly we need to move into a phase where the relationship is comfortable, I would say, or has the space uh, for the Europeans to take up their responsibility within that relationship. And I think, as uh, Professor Biscop has already said, initiatives like PESCO are quite clearly designed not to duplicate NATO. They're actually designed for us to take up what uh, NATO has called for and even successive secretaries of defense from the US have been calling for even before President Trump's uh, entry into the White House. There's a long-term trend there, and I think we're trying to answer that call, and again, identity comes back into this, in a very special EU way. It might not look uh, very obvious, it might not be fully understood by the relationships or the partners we have, but it's the best show in town we have to push cooperation forward. Uh, and then finally, there's another form of schizophrenia, which we need to keep in mind. And that relates more specifically to the level of ambition, military level of ambition. What do we really think uh, uh, CSDP and EU defense from an operational point of view means in the future? And the schizophrenia, I think, uh, will become uh, much more of an, uh, an issue that we need to manage, especially with a lot of these uh, initiatives like the Defense Fund, like CARD and PESCO, where we have to have con uh, conversations about strategic prioritization and the prioritization of capabilities. And let me be very, very blunt here, and I'll ask this in the question form. Is the EU going to remain merely a regional player, or does it actually want to be a global player? Very, very important question. If we don't have an answer to that question, uh, we will find it very difficult to try and prioritize the capabilities in the future. So we have to, despite the global strategy, despite the implementation plan on security and defense, we're still waiting for that conversation to be had collectively between the member states about in five, 10, 15 years from now, what role does the European Union want to play in the world? And if you try to answer that question, actually you come back to the identity question. Okay? And I'll end there. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much for your presentation. You definitely have given us food for thought, and uh, maybe we can get more into detail during the question round. Uh, professor, we could continue with your presentation, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is this working? Yeah, I guess it is. Um, well, I follow on well from Daniel because he asked the question, where are we going? I want to actually just step back and see where we've come from. I wrote 20 years ago in one of the earliest studies of CSDP that European integration began with defense, and it did. Throughout the 40s and the early 50s, it was all about defense how Europe could get its defense act together uh, to please the Americans to some extent. And we failed. So for 40 years, European security and defense identity was NATO, was Atlanticist. End of story. So why did we get CSDP in the first place? The end of the Cold War, there were four reasons. The first was this clear belief right across Europe that only a European project, rather than a NATO one where free riding had become endemic, only a European project would allow the Europeans to stump up the money, get the energy and the focus to actually deliver something worth delivering. I want to stress something worth, worth having. Second reason, and in fact, messages from Washington DC at that time were saying very clearly, if you don't do this, NATO is in danger. Second reason is that there's something called the Atlantic Ocean. Yes, we share values. I believe we share values across the Atlantic. But our interests are not identical. And at the end of the Cold War, it's very obvious that those interests were going to continue to diverge. America's focus, uh, the tilt to Asia, the American operations in the Middle East are not new. These have been in full flow since the 1980s and are getting stronger and stronger. The third reason is that Europe was posturing as a global power at the time, the EU, uh, with Schengen, with the single market, with all of this, Europe was going to become a global power. And the fourth reason, frankly, is that if Europe was to es escape total dependency on the four big American armament companies, it had to have a European defense industrial base. So uh, we embark on this thing. And you will recall that the first effort of the Europeans to do this was something called the European Security and Defense Identity. ESDI, remember that? Combined Joint Task Forces, Berlin Plus, I, uh, a, a European command chain, all of those things, uh, which took place from about 92 to 96, 7, right? It failed for all sorts of reasons, but the most important reason was that this was actually, ESDI was actually an attempt for the Europeans to play a more effective a more useful role in American grand strategy. American leadership was absolute. European followership was unquestioned. This was the time, remember, when uh, NATO had to go global in order to avoid going out of business. So there was a fundamental contradiction in ESDI at the time, that the Europeans are trying to uh, project themselves as autonomous players through a mechanism which makes them subordinate secondary players to American grand strategy. That is why the San Malo Declaration talks about autonomy. And autonomy was the key concept in the San Malo Declaration, which launches CSDP. I can't stress this enough. The European security and defense identity, according to CSDP, has to be done outside of NATO, in cooperation with NATO, of course. Of course, in cooperation with NATO. But it has to come from outside NATO. I don't want to go through the history of CSDP. I've written far too much about this, as have many others in this room. Uh, but basically, I think many of us, long-term analysts of CSDP, came to the conclusion sometime in the early 2010s that this thing had failed. It had run into the sand. It started off as a military ambition. The first three of the first five missions were military, 2003, 2004. But then it gradually developed a footprint as an essentially civilian actor missions, with security sector reform, with uh, you know, border missions and so on and so forth. Nobody's decrying that, but the identity had gone off key and become something very different from what uh, was intended at the outset. I believe then that CSDP as a form of European identity, security and defense identity, was still born. CSDP in its first 10 years did not achieve what it had set out to achieve in the San Malo Declaration. 
that was where we were in 2016, when according to this narrative, which we're hearing very strongly, everything began to change. My question is, what exactly has changed? Brexit, Donald Trump sounded very strong alarm bells, but they did not drive the change. There were all sorts of uh, reasons. And we've talked about PESCO, we've talked about the OHQ slash MPCC, we've talked about CARD, we've talked about uh, the European Defence Fund. All of these initiatives, very important initiatives, uh, suggest that the EU is finally beginning to get its head around what it is, as Daniel said, it is trying to achieve. Because without clear uh, uh, view of what it is the EU is trying to achieve, we can't get anywhere. Now, I don't want to throw water on the party or be a party pooper or anything, but most of the most serious analyses that are coming out right now about Europe as a strategically autonomous player are very pessimistic. Frédéric Moreau, in a very important study uh, of the concept of strategic autonomy, makes it very clear that Europe hasn't a clue what it means by strategic autonomy at almost any level. Um, this is uh, uh, at either the uh, political, the operational, or the industrial levels. Sven, in the new book, makes it very clear that Europe has never really come to terms with power, with what power means, with what the other person's power can do to us. Europe plays the role of a global tooth fairy, and it must stop playing the role of a global tooth fairy. There's a forthcoming article in the Journal of Common Market Studies, which is the most serious journal of European studies. It's coming out soon. I'm not going to give you the name of the author, uh, but this article says that Europe is a strategic, it's a strategic in all sorts of senses. It lacks any clear strategic appraisal of its external environment. It has never grasped what grand strategy is all about, the ends, ways, and means triptych. I don't want to go into the jargon here. Its external objectives are overly aspirational, eight millions. Uh, it reflects a clear absence of priorities, or an absence of clear priorities, and a refusal to take hard, tough choices. Now, this is bad news. I'm sorry about this, but I think that we have to face up to that. Anne-Marie Le Groinet, the late and dearly missed Anne-Marie Le Groinet from Sciences Po in Paris, in a very important book which has just come out called Europe by Default, argues that the European Union kind of stabilized the continent without really understanding what it was doing, because enlargement was not a strategy. Enlargement was a reaction to demand from those who wished to enlarge. And she concludes her book in a very pessimistic way by saying that all of the crises we're living in now are actually um, the end of an era. Ukraine, refugee, Brexit, Trump, authoritarian governments in Hungary and Poland, etc. She says, quote, mark the end of an order. Mark the end of an order that the Union strove to establish, tried to establish a stable Europe. And we've actually reached the end of the road there. So, in order to have this identity, we have to be very clear about what our strategic objectives are and how to get there. And in my recent work, and the, the thing I wrote for the Martin Center is being distributed, I'm not going to go through that, but I'll give you the conclusion of that. I think we face three options for identity. And, and a lot of these depend on whether the European Union succeeds in overcoming the crises. The first one is, if we don't, we could very well opt for an identity as a global tooth fairy, as a exemplary power, as somebody who exports value. That didn't work in the past, and it certainly is not going to work in this uh, new world order that Sven talked about this morning, uh, an order of power transition and multipolarity, where power is back with a vengeance. The second option is to pursue what we're doing now with, with PESCO, with the OHQ, with EDF, with the battle groups, all of these things that we've been talking about. But this would not amount to strategic autonomy. It would leave the European Union existentially dependent, if there were a serious threat from the outside, on the United States. It would satisfy those who think we should do something more, but, it, but who don't think that Europe could or should do much more because at the end of the day, the identity will remain American, NATO, as the default. So 
So the final scenario, and, and I think that this second scenario is the one we're going towards, but there's a final scenario which I put to you, uh, which those of you who've heard it before, I apologize, but I believe that if we're serious about strategic autonomy, it means ending Europe's dependency on the United States, not breaking up the alliance, but ending the state of dependency. Many Americans are calling for this. The Europeans are stand up, take responsibility for the neighborhood. Neighborhood. This is not a wild, wacky idea. This is a very, very widely thought idea in the United States. Europe should not accept the role as per permanent subcontractor to American grand strategy. If Europeans truly believe, as I do, that we share with the Americans core values, there is no problem in the short-term adaptation of a rebalancing within NATO. And my heretical argument is that this should be done through NATO and not in contradistinction to NATO. There were many reasons why ESDP, CSDP should have been founded at the turn of the century and was, didn't work. There are no longer the reasons for keeping these two things totally distinctive. Trying to find something to do that NATO isn't doing. This doesn't make any sense. So I believe that we should do it and we should aim for the Europeanization of NATO en bonne intelligence with the Americans, talking all the time about how we can rebalance the, the, the responsibilities and leadership within the United, within, uh, within NATO, within the Atlantic Alliance. So, and to emerge really as equal partners, because that is manifestly in the interests of the United States, just as it is in the interests of the European Union. Now, I was asked to talk about Brexit for a few minutes. It takes far too long. Um, I will, uh, if, if there's a question about Brexit, that's fine. I believe that the EU and the UK will come to some sort of cooperative working arrangement, but I think that in terms of the decision about European defense identity, this is a decision that the Europeans should make and not be constantly thinking about how the UK may or may not fit into this. Once Europeans have decided which way they want to go, then we can talk to the Brits. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Professor Howarth, for this very passionate and rather pessimistic presentation, I might no, say. <laughs> okay, then. It's the only way to go. Um, no, I completely agree with you. Uh, now we move on uh, with our guest, uh, Vice Prime Minister. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, when you're invited to speak about identity, especially in this part of the world, you know, it, it, grow, it, it uh, creates too many parallels and links to the past. So this is actually a very, a very uh, visible change. You know, we are talking about identities that shape the future and not identities shaped by our past. And it's a, it's a welcome change after being uh, stuck in a discussion about identities for too many years <laughs> in, in this region. Uh, I will uh, start uh, by saying that I sit at a different uh, chair compared to the other two, two uh, participants in the discussion. Uh, I come from a country that, I dare to say, benefited from all the weaknesses from the common security and foreign policy, and probably was one of the successes among other maybe failures or, 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 or uh, less visible successes. And uh, for me, uh, as, as someone coming from this region, from a country struggling uh, to start accession talks with the EU, the sooner the better, country struggling uh, after a 10 year delay to get an invitation for NATO. For me, uh, reading some of the, the, the statements after the, the new strategy, uh, where several people have insisted that uh, in order to develop this new defense EU uh, identity, uh, the European Union has to present its, itself as a credible power on the global scene, which will be rational, wise, and calm. I thought that it was a good uh, summary. I, I have to say that I missed one, one word, maybe it was uh, there in the title. You know, power with strategic decision making is what I think needs to be uh, repeated again and again. Because uh, the strategic um, autonomy is one thing, but it being able to act, being able to make the decisions with this strategic goal in mind 
I think offers, uh, offers an added value uh, to the EU. Uh, in order for the European Union to become a successful, um, or at least a global player, as, as you have referred to, it has to be already a successful regional player. And uh, I believe that there is still some work to be done there. Uh, I, I, I endorse the view that uh, the, the enlargement was uh, sometimes pushed more by the newcomers than actually by, by the decision makers in the EU, uh, but it was a successful uh, strategy and it did provide for an additional security on the continent, so it actually met the, the criteria, it met the, 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 the reasoning behind it. And uh, the positive uh, changes uh, recently with the renewed focus on the Western Balkans, I think are, are the step in the right direction. What we have seen after several years of very strong words by key European officials that enlargement has to be put on you know, a side track, it has to be prolonged, it, you know, Europe needs a strategic pause, uh, they were not only detrimental to parts of the European continent, that they were detrimental to building this uh, new sense of not only responsibility but power and active approach vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the continent itself. Uh, so uh, let me say that uh, what we have seen not only lately but also many years ago uh, were concrete evidence on how EU can be more active and more decisive, but also how the cooperation with NATO can act smoothly if there are good discussions and uh, shared interests. And I will have to say that Macedonia, this is why I started there, Macedonia was such an example back in 2001. When we have faced our own internal conflict, one of the one of the developments that actually saved the day, both for us and for, for our partners, was a very, very strong, almost daily cooperation and commitment by both NATO and the EU on A, the goal, which is to preserve the stability, and B, the steps that were needed to get us there. And I have to say that, that uh, uh, probably EU and NATO, to a certain extent, have not really, uh, assessed this as positively as I think that they have, uh, they have earned. Because what we had in Macedonia was a series of different missions, NATO-led, EU-led, and a very, very strong cooperation mechanism between the two. In certain phases, it was the NATO military presence that served the purpose. Uh, when it came to, to negotiations and political settlements, it was both the EU and the US that actually led the process. In the beginning, during the difficult negotiations, it was you know, visibly that EU is strategically supporting uh, the, the, the role uh, of the US to broker an agreement. But very soon, when it came to details, implementation, making the right environment for, for political uh, compromise, it was the, the, the soft power, but still power of the EU that uh, delivered a positive outcome. And for a while there was, in the case at least of Macedonia, there was practically um, an absence of this visible cooperation between EU and, and NATO. And then came the political crisis in Macedonia. And then what we saw was again uh, a, a decision by both EU and NATO to go back to the fundamentals and to the basic and start the discussion about what are the values that, that uh, link the two organizations. So after 2014 and the initial signal from the EU that things are not looking good in the country on important key issues such as uh, free media, rule of law, uh, uh, independent institutions, you know, human rights, inter-ethnic relations, you know, core values, uh, we have seen very quickly that the same concerns are reflected also in NATO summit conclusions. But I, I, I think that uh, you know, when, it, when it's all about reports and assessments, it makes sense. You know, the two institutions follow each other. They, they read each other's reports. They respect each other's positions. But what I think was striking was uh, uh, what happened last year, almost exactly a year ago uh, from today, 
when Macedonia uh, saw the climax in its uh, uh, internal political crisis, when we had a group of people that attacked parliament and attempted actually to, to even murder uh, some of the members of the parliamentary majority and future government. Uh, so this, is the, this was the first time after a while that actually uh, Ms. Mogherini came to Macedonia and uh, she had a statement saying that she delivers a message uh, on behalf of the EU, but also of NATO. And that was rather rare, but it showed that when the going gets tough, when there is a crisis, you know, we go back to our old manuals that we need this cooperation very much. Uh, so uh, we do believe that uh, uh, right now, after seeing how quickly security can be lost after a series of fundamental core weaknesses in a country like Macedonia, in the region like the Balkans, but all, not only here, I think that the, the, the EU uh, returned focus to the Balkans, also through the lens of security, is a smart strategic decision making. I remember uh, going through uh, one of the Eurobarometer polls saying that uh, European citizens have lost uh, the attraction to enlargement. I actually have my doubts that there were strong uh, attractions to start with. Of course, in the 90s, there was this, this uh, feeling that suddenly Europe is, is uniting, but we have seen uh, drawbacks and we have seen some skepticism after 2000, 2002, definitely. But what was very clear in the same opinion poll was that yes, people in the European Union are skeptical about uh, continuing enlargement, but they're very clear about security returning to the forefront of the agenda. And uh, this security cannot be uh, realistic if there are still strategic gaps in the continent. Uh, therefore, I, I do hope that this, this is what dominated the discussions also about what EU can do when it comes to this region, when it comes to, to the security of the continent. And the result of this was, was the new enlarged strategy. And I think that the spirit is already there. We have seen some of the benefits uh, from this interest, maybe not in all EU member states, but we have definitely seen it here in the Balkans uh, because people see that uh, if you leave too many things unattended, if you allow for uh, a long political or, or strategic vacuum, the vacuum got, gets filled with all sorts of things that we consider a European security threat. Uh, so I, I, I do believe that the European defense identity will take some time. I do hope that it won't be seen only through the lens of autonomy, but uh, I do hope that it will provide for more strategic, forward-looking, courageous decisions on behalf uh, of the European Union for the sake of European Union member states, but also for the sake of all of us uh, who depend on strong and dedicated Europe. Thank you very much, Vice Prime Minister Shekerinska, for sharing with us your in points, your insights. And if it's okay with you, gentlemen, I would proceed with Ambassador Riker and uh, leave Vice Admiral Efdimov to okay. do the finishing part. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And my apologies for uh, arriving a few minutes late. Um, it's a heavy agenda today in, in Sofia, uh, but I'm delighted to, uh, to be back here. I want to thank the, the organizers, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation uh, for doing this. I think these kinds of fora are so important. Uh, and I think the last time I was uh, in Sofia uh, was uh, for the similar forum. Uh, and uh, it's very good to see such expertise come together. So I'm honored to be on, uh, on a panel back in a part of the world that uh, has been very much a part of my uh, professional life and certainly um, therefore part of my personal life uh, as well. After a, a short hiatus in my diplomatic career, I'm being very busy and having a wonderful time serving in, in northern Italy uh, to come back to the Balkans. Uh, brings back a certain level of, uh, of reality and discussions about identity are very much uh, a part of that. 
in terms of identity, uh, I actually have, have made a, a slight change in, in my own identity uh, in recent months uh, when I was asked to uh, move to a military uh, billet while I continue to be a, a career uh, United States uh, diplomat. Um, I was asked to take up the position as civilian deputy commander at uh, US European Command uh, based in Stuttgart, of course. Um, and I'm in that capacity the senior uh, foreign policy and political advisor to uh, General Scaparotti, the commander of, of European Command. Now another important point in terms of identity is to understand that I am not uh, working for General Scaparotti in his other capacity. Uh, talk about schizophrenic, um, as the Supreme Allied Commander uh, at SHAPE. Um, so we talked uh, a little bit about uh, shaping identity, and, and there are too many puns there, um, but uh, it's often confusing. And for General Scaparotti, who travels constantly uh, between Mons and Brussels and Stuttgart and all throughout uh, this area of responsibility, uh, wearing two different hats, going back to Washington, regularly reporting to, uh, to Congress, the Secretary of Defense. Um, it's a, a very fascinating place to watch the emergence of, of uh, these issues. Um, and I, in fact, serve then as the primary link between General Scaparotti as his, as his in, in his European, in his UCOM hat, um, linking with uh, the Department of State. Um, and that means, uh, Part of my job is to bridge uh, between the command, the, the combatant command, uh, and all of our diplomatic posts uh, throughout Europe, um, as well as Israel, which is a part of uh, European command. So that's 52 uh, missions. Uh, it does mean that um, the idea of a quiet life uh, and a very nice uh, residential part of Patch Barracks in Stuttgart um, is not what I have. And in fact, I find myself uh, traveling around quite a bit, particularly because General Scaparotti feels it's uh, extremely important uh, to get out, to, to visit, uh, to engage. And of course, he was just here in Sofia a couple of weeks ago wearing that NATO hat uh, as Supreme Allied Commander uh, and had a very good uh, series of, of meetings here. So this job uh, has proven to be um, quite a, an interesting uh, assignment. Uh, but the reason I'm there is uh, really an expression of the command leadership uh, in terms of acknowledging the fact that there needs to be a broader whole of government approach uh, to security challenges. And General Scaparotti uh, and other senior leaders, and, and this is throughout our uh, defense establishment, uh, believes very strongly in having the civilian input. After all, we have a civilian-led military we have a, a former military officer who is now a civilian as the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and that's key to uh, the United States Constitution, to our system, uh, and I think key to our success. And that's recognized by uh, our most senior military leaders uh, as well. This is particularly important now as we deal with uh, gray zone conflicts, uh, hybrid uh, conflicts, the challenges uh, short of warfare that require uh, not just military solutions, but indeed the diplomatic, but as well as every component, uh, every tool. And at US European Command, we have representatives, which I coordinate uh, from our Treasury Department, from the FBI, law enforcement agencies, uh, drug enforcement agency, dealing with international crime, obviously cyber uh, experts, uh, aid and development experts, uh, disaster relief um, and, and crisis management ex experts, who come from a variety of, uh, of government offices. The commander himself, uh, on a daily basis, but the rest of the senior leadership, is always very eager to know what does the US ambassador think? If there's a question about uh, developments in, in uh, Armenia or Malta or any other corner of this vast uh, area of responsibility, the first thing they will ask me is, what does the ambassador think? What is the embassy saying? What, what's the reporting? They want that context. Um, and they're equally keen to know the perspectives and priorities and equities of our allies and partners. Uh, what does the US ambassador 
saying, but what is the government of Bulgaria saying to him? What are their views? What are their e equities? And it's been quite uh, uh, reassuring to me to see how much that uh, directs and designs uh, our planning, uh, posture, and uh, strategy at, at European command. Um, General Scaparotti himself, in, in testimony to Congress recently, uh, said, and I'll, I'll quote him, uh, in augmenting our defense, the United States has been joined by the NATO alliance, which remains critical to our national security and to the rules-based international order. Every challenge we face as a nation is best addressed with our allies. He believes that, he's widely supported in that, and, and where I sit now at UCOM, despite some of the controversies and the uh, transitions and, and uh, changes, uh, I can tell you firsthand that, that this is not rhetoric, that uh, European Command uh, and the Department of Defense takes very seriously the capabilities and, and contributions which our allies and partners uh, bring to the fight, or perhaps bring to the effort not to have a fight. Uh, and in my view, this is really the very crux of, of burden sharing, the debate uh, which has gotten so much attention, but I think in many ways is not well understood. Uh, the simple fact that European security uh, is, in fact, uh, U.S. security uh, is not disputed, despite the attempts by some to suggest otherwise. Um, but I think it should be evident to all uh, that uh, the United States' commitment to NATO and to European security remains ironclad. I would point out that last week, uh, our new Secretary of State, uh, Secretary Pompeo, uh, was confirmed by the Senate, sworn in uh, within an hour of that, and within two hours was at uh, joint base Andrews getting on a military plane to fly overnight to Brussels. 12 hours and 35 minutes after his swearing in, he was sitting at the North Atlantic Council, one among equals of representatives uh, for the foreign ministerial meeting. And uh, that was very intentional on his part. In fact, the push to get his uh, nomination finished, to, to get confirmation in the Senate, uh, from the administration, and many of you saw the president weighed in personally on this, um, was very much to make sure he could be there showing the United States engagement at the North Atlantic Council and the, important of that, the importance of that. Uh, and he had, I think, uh, some very important comments to say that should have been reassuring uh, to many. Um, and that I've seen in, in the six months I've been in this position that uh, the ongoing emphasis about burden sharing. Every country I go to, before I can even walk in the door, they say, yes, yes, we know, 2%, 2%. <laughs> and uh, I say, well, that, that is very important indeed. Uh, the, the president believes that's important, and it is important, and it's something all allies uh, agreed to in terms of uh, investing in the resources uh, for de defense. But uh, the push for contributions from European allies is, is not uh, rooted in the United States' desire to do less, uh, but rather, I think, in an overall recognition that our allies and, and partners have serious capabilities and know how to address the ever-evolving complexities of the European security environment. And I think it really is, uh, while a challenge politically, financially, obviously, um, it also represents a real opportunity for European countries um, in that with U.S. Uh, support, European countries can make available capabilities and platforms to influence the shape uh, and identity of their own security environment. So for that reason, uh, the United States fully supports uh, enhanced European defense initiatives like PESCO. Uh, I was at the Munich Security Conference and there was a lot of whispering behind the, the scenes. Uh, were the Americans uh, upset by PESCO? Where did they think? In fact, uh, General Scaparotti and I were having dinner the other night, and, and he said, you know, this is what we've been encouraging Europe to do for 40 years, more. Uh, this kind of uh, permanent, structured cooperation. 
Uh, and of course, uh, the underlying assumption, uh, uh, not even a caveat, but, but the basis to that is that such projects, like PESCO and other initiatives, seek to complement rather than duplicate uh, existing NATO capabilities and structures. Uh, obviously, a lot of these initiatives uh, in PESCO are still at, at very nascent stages, but uh, based on a lot of conversations I've had at Brussels, uh, the engagement of our uh, U.S. mission to the European Union, which works very closely with the U.S. mission to NATO to try to engage broadly and, and understand uh, and offer uh, support and input on these initiatives. Um, I think there's really a cause for, for optimism. Um, there's widespread understanding still, and I think we're hearing it on this panel today too, that while um, collective defense per se um, is a NATO mission, uh, that many of the emerging security issues across the theater and frankly globally should be addressed jointly by NATO and the European Union in various formats. This includes issues like cyber, uh, the hybrid threats, terrorism, uh, and military mobility, a topic that has uh, a significant amount of uh, focus these days uh, at European Command uh, and in Brussels uh, and individual capitals where we are focused on the need to update infrastructure to allow us to move uh, military equipment, resupply uh, for exercises, obviously, but to be prepared uh, for the potential needs. Uh, and the fact that the EU is stepping up to the plate, uh, engaging in this way, uh, should be welcomed. And uh, part of our job is to educate back to Washington uh, from the military command, from our embassies, to help uh, Congress uh, and ultimately the American public understand what Europe is doing uh, and contributing. Uh, and being careful to emphasize that the EU efforts uh, should be and in fact are uh, coordinated with uh, and supportive uh, of NATO efforts and capability targets. Uh, but it really is a, a window of opportunity for European countries. Um, it's an opportunity to uh, together develop new technologies, to develop new ways of doing things. Um, and I think it's, it's quite symbolic uh, in many ways that it's sort of 75 years this year uh, since US troops came to Europe or came back to Europe, a, a country that was founded in many ways on uh, European ideals um, with uh, people from across Europe as well as uh, other parts of the world who came to Europe 100 years ago for the First World War and helped end that, and then left. And when we were brought back uh, with the Second World War, uh, landing uh, 75 years ago this, this year uh, in Italy uh, for Sicily and the Italian campaign, and you, and you all know the history, we realized that we needed to stay. And we needed to work with European partners to develop a series of institutions a uh, series of rules, uh, and it's, it's the Euro-Atlantic, transatlantic uh, structures that have allowed us to live uh, in an unprecedented period of uh, peace on this continent, uh, which has, of course, given us an opening to an unprecedented level of, of prosperity. Um, and so 75 years on from that, from what one might say, the, the founding of U.S.-European command when U.S. troops arrived uh, on the continent. Um, we're still there. We're still headquartered in, in Stuttgart. We're still very much engaged in this, but we very much also welcome uh, the new efforts uh, to expand and shape uh, an identity for European and transatlantic security uh, that fits the 21st century. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll stop and say thank you again for the, the opportunity to be back here. Look forward to questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ricker, and we'll move straight on to our final guest of the second panel. <coughs> Vice Admiral, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Madam Minister, your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me first thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and uh, just giving me opportunity to briefly touch upon on Bulgaria Airport's uh, approach to building uh, sustainable the broader aspects of uh, European and uh, Europe. 
public uh, defense and security architecture. Having this conference in Bulgaria, I was advised by the organizers to speak in Bulgaria, and I'm going to do so, but then in a Q&A session, uh, session uh, I may speak uh, in English and in English. So, Bulgaria is a member of NATO and European Union, един конкрет усилий, кое има ангажименти, ангажимент за определени способности да бъдат предоставени на Златна съюза, където и когато е необходимо. Ангажиментите, които поемаме, стандарти, които помагаме в двата формата са съвести и това не задължава още повече да поддържаме боеспособни въоръжени сили. Към настоящия момент българските въоръжени сили вършиха прегляд на изпълнението на програмата за развитие на въоръжени сили и плана за развитие до 2020 година. Беше направен анализ на конкретован техничен състав, развитието на проектите за модернизация, ограничените финансови ресурси и изменената държава сигурност. Изпълнение на тези ангажименти в началото на 2018 година Министерският съвет на Република България прие национален план за достигане на раст и безотправност за 2% от брутния вътрешен продукт от 2024 година, което поставя нови предизвикателства пред планирането на въоръжените сили. Това решение беше отчетено от страна на партньорите като положителна стъпка за развитието на отрекомните способности на България. В рамките на бюджета на Лабраза ни се стремим да предлагаме комплексен подход, да използваме възможности на механизми на сътрудничество и участие в инициативи и проекти за изграждане на необходимите способности. По-наташно си изложение ще се струна процеса на изграждане на способностите в Болиния на НАТО, Европейския съюз и пространното сътрудничество. Болиния на НАТО. Болиния на НАТО говорим за две основни направления. Това е участване в проекти като инициативата Интелигентна отрана или Smart Defense. По-настоящи му участваме в 24 проекта, разделени в три отбрути. Процесът на планиране на отбраната на НАТО или НДПП е другия и основен механизъм за постигане на необходимите отбранителни способности. Той осигурява рамката, с която се хармонизира националното отбранително планиране и процесът на планиране на отбраната на Альянса, като помага изграждането и предоставянето на необходимите сили и способности за участие в пълния спектър на мисия и операция на Альянса. Тоест, изпълнявайки, давайки възможност да се изпълни нивото на амбиция на Альянса. В момента изпълняваме пакет, приехме изпълняване за почтивно изпълнението на проект Сили 2017. Има естествено приемственост с третия пакет Сили 2013 година, като фокуса в новия пакет се поставя върху изпълнението на операции за колективна отбрана и воля на бойни действия с високи интенситет. Това е естествено новия във връзка с изменената среда със сигурност. В този процес приоритетите за България са изграждането на тежка механизирана бригада, хеви механа и други и развитието и усъвършенстването на морската ситуационна осведоменост. По изграждане способност чрез механизмите на Европейския съюз. През тяхната година бяха предприяти и реалистите стъпки на европейско ново по практически изпълнение на приоритетите, протичащи от новата глобална стратегия на Европейския съюз. Заместник министр за правото бе информира в Петухинов спикер за основните моменти в политиката на България. По отношение на военните аспекти и нашето участие в формулирането и развитието на тази политика, ние подкрепихме създаването на новата структура от военния секретарят на Европейския съюз за планира и провеждане на военни миси на стратегическо ниво, Military Planning and Standard Capability. Считаме, че така ще се осигури своевременно планиране и ръководство на този тип военно-тренировачни миси, което липсваше до момента и натоварваше командирите от оперативното ниво. Също така приветствено решението на съвета на Европейския съюз за координиране годишния прегът на отбраната КАК. Възприемаме този механизъм като средство за систематичен обмен на информация по отношение на отборителното планиране и изпълнение на плана за развитие на способностите. 
Подкрепваме също възприятие под плод да не създава допълнителна администрация, като в същото време умов система ще трябва да се запази Барселона с тип на синхронизирането на дейности с процеса на отбраните планира е план. Участието ни в ПЕСКО е в рамките на националното ниво на амбиция и наличните ресурси, което към момент се изразява за виното желание за участие в следните основни проекти. Network of Logistics Clubs in Europe and Support to Operations, Military Mobility and Upgrade of Maritime Surveillance. Както може да направите връзка с които ще отложи в отношение, с това е директна връзка с процесите в НАТО. Един от приоритетите по които България се учи усилят си е стратегическа необходимост за сила на обявяване на мобилност. Както казах, това съвпада с целите на Европейския съюз и е фундаментално изискване на НАТО за своевременно разрушите на силите в много висока степен на готовност, на зоната на отговорност на командващия театър. Именно този пакт обослови високия интерес на политическото и военно руководство за постигане на напредък в областта на обявяване на мобилност. По нашия национален принос към Полната част от развитие на концепция за бърз отговор на Европейския съюз и бойните групи на Европейския съюз, участваме активно в бойната група Хелброк, водеща страна Гърция и с участие на Кипър, Румъния и Украина. Групата в момента е на джижурство, първо полугоре на 2018 година. Считаме, че бойните групи на Европейския съюз са важен инструмент за бърз отговор на Европейския съюз под кризи. Подкрепяме усилията за оптимизиране на условията за тяхното използване. Разширяват на възможност за общото финансиране на бойните групи ще стимулира тяхното използване, с което ще се издигне и ролята им за постигане на заявеното ниво на амбиция на Европейския съюз. По отношение на приноса ни към мисии и операции на Европейския съюз, имаме условен ангажимент в операция АЛТЕ, където поддържаме готовно строят на Виржина резерв и в момента има действия щитърни офицери в общава на силите в Сараево. Участваме и от наблюдателната мисия в Грузия, Мали, Аталанта, Юпол, Афганистан, Юна Порвет, където е нищо дни в Сирия. Укрепването на сигурността и стабилността в Западните Балкани са част от приоритетите на българското председателство. В тази връзка България е заинтересована от ефективното използване на военните сили и средства на операция от тия, като фактор за поддържане на сигурността, сейфен секюр и нагласен в района. Считаме, че трябва да се използва всяка възможност за координиране на стратегически послания, съвместно между НАТО и Европейския съюз, и провеждане с гласуване на действия по изграждане на капацитет и устойчивост на Западните Балкани. В по-надачното си изложение имам информация относно проекти от портфолиото на Европейската агенция по отбрана и Европейската програма за индивидуално защита по гласовно право. Не искам да се повтарям, но ще се позволя, използвайки, как да се каже, академик Фридон в време на конференцията, на конференция да изразя мнение отношно от гледна точка на крайните потребители. Защото ние, военните, сме крайни потребители на политиките, които се провеждат в политиките, адресиращи сигурността и отбраната. Както загадвам в моите изложения, ние подкрепяме истенца програми и инициативи, които са адресирани към военната мобилност, към споделяне на логистика, към транспортни хъбови. Но кога се отнася вече за конкретни технически проекти, ние сме, как да кажа, хоушъс. Защото накрая тяхното поддържане, техният жизнен цикъл, sustainability, life cycle, лежи на нашия бюджет. В тази връзка нашия апел е към хората, които са въвлечени в развитието на тези програми, да мислят и отгледна точка на крайните потребители. Третия процес, на който искам да се спра по отношение на изграждане на способност, това е чрез механизмите на двустранното сътрудничество. Наред с процеса на планиране на отбраната в НАТО и инициативане за реализиране на глобалната стратегия за външна политика и политика за сигурност, България успешно реализира механизмите за изграждане на отвратените капацитет по линия на двустранното сътрудничество. В тази връзка следва да признаем бъдещата роля на Съединени Читати като активен партнер на Европа за изграждане на национални и колективни отвратителни способности, допълващи и развиващи способности на НАТО в региона. 
Финансирате от Конгреса на САЩ инициативи като инициатива за гарантиране на сигурността на европейски съюзници, в последствие преминала европейска инициатива за разбиране, съпадства за двустранно и многонационално сътрудничество. Партнерските взаимоотношения между Република България и Съединените щати в сферата на сигурността са базирани на, на споразумение между правителството на България и правителството на САЩ от 2006 година за сътрудничество в областта на обраната. Споразумението и механизмите по неговото прилагане уреждат рамката на засилено партньорство и сътрудничество. Резултатите са от него са най-общитливи в следните две направления. Първо, в отношение на подготовката, която се характеризира не само с увеличен брой учения, но и с услужляване и повишаване на тяхната, тяхното съдържание и комплексност на отработените сценарии и тактически епизоди. Пример в това отношение е проведението на национално учение с цей Баргария, на което 17 на която нашата страна беше една от страните домакина. Второ в областта на развитие на инфраструктурата на съвместни съоръжения, по силата на това споразумение ние имаме две летища, тренировка, тренцентър, сходът правилно, на които финансираните изпълняват силите на САЩ. Проекти взаимно допълват проекти програмата на НАТО за инвестиции в сигурността НСИ, като повишава способност за придвижване, приемане, разполагане и подготовка на войските. Като съпредседател на комисията, участвам активно в процеса на последното заседание, взехме решение да разработим пътна карта, заедно с Европейското команда на щатите, която да води които цели да бъдат адресирани към преди от България а, пакет цели 17 по линия на НАТО. По този начин а, искаме наистина да използваме всички механизми, които а, водят до изграждане на отранителни способности. В заключение, поставянето на фокуса върху сигурността и отбраната като една от най-приоритетните области за работа по изпълнение на глобалната стратегия на Европейския съюз предполага нови възможности но и нови предизвикателства. Като държава членка на двата съюза, България е заинтересована в постигането на високо ниво на политическо, економическо и военно взаимодействие и използване на всички възможности за координиране действия между НАТО и Европейския съюз, водещо до изграждане на капацитет и устойчивост на сигурността и отправата. Благодаря за вниманието. Session. Uh, please uh, state your name and position, and then a short, brief uh, question to our panelists. Yes, uh, the Mr. right there, the gentleman, yes. Oops. Казвам се Бождар Андонов, професор си в Богословския факултет София. Много се радвам, че а, господин Фиот и господин професора а, загаднаха една тема за идентичността. А, различните а, идентичности споменахте, но пропуснахте според мен една много важна идентичност. И особено тук са православните страни. Това е идентичността по веровият въпрос. Ние сме православни страни и сме членове в Европейския съюз. Аз изпомням, когато България трябваше да влезе в Европейския съюз и бяхме поканени от Конрад Аденао фундацията в Берлин да представиме визията на България като политика, като общество, но също и от Богословския факултет аз взех участие да представя историята на нашата църква и ролята й за нашата идентичност през а, вековете. А, както за България е важна тази идентичност на православна основа, така тя е, е важна и в а, Румъния. Uh, please, a short, a okay. yes? <clears throat> Въпросът ми е, вземате ли предвид вие този фактор на идентичност. Веровата, православната, за да можем с един глас да разговаряме, защото идват и Сърбия, идват и Македония. Благодаря. Okay.
Please. Allow me to respond straight yes, away? Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> I guess if I can be short, uh, the only uh, theological or real religious or orthodox position I start and end with is we need more military capability. <laughs> and I start and finish there. I mean, we're talking about defense identity. And uh, that's my departure point. Uh, it's quite clear that we need to be much more capable at the EU level. Uh, and as I said during my presentation, notwithstanding the differences between nations and member states, quite clearly we move in a direction now where it seems that many member states collectively are willing to uh, move beyond just words. That they actually want to engage in developing capabilities together with the overarching aim of making the EU a much more capable defense actor. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, there was another question from the gentleman in the gray. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dimitar Delchev. I'm uh, chair of Bulgaria of the Citizens Political Party here in Bulgaria. First of all, I would like to thank to the organizers, Conor Tadanar Foundation, Martin Center, Sofia Forum for Security, and the Austrian Institute for organizing this really important and really interesting conference uh, and I would like to discuss another threat which I think we missed uh, during the different talks and this is the nuclear threat. Uh, we spoke about artificial intelligence, we spoke about drones and, uh, and other stuff but the, the nuclear threat hangs somewhere there and we see it in the um, program of Iran for development of, of, of nuclear um, uh, means uh, which, as uh, stated by Israel, uh, is not the, the one stated by, by Iran. So maybe there is something there. Uh, we saw it uh, in the recent months by North Korea. Yes, recently there are some developments there with regards to peace, but uh, the, the nuclear threat still exists. And actually the world uh, went to a direction where nuclear disarmament was the, the most important priority. Now this uh, shifts with the, with, the, with the statement of President Putin, with the statement of President Trump, it turns out that uh, nuclear armament is an, again an issue. So whoever wants to, to share his thoughts on, on this issue, because uh, this is, I think, uh, an important uh, topic which we also have to have in mind. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So if anyone would like to start, feel free to do so. Um, I would simply say that I agree that this is an issue that has to be grappled with. And in the study which I did for the Martin Center, I actually have a couple of long, three long paragraphs about how Europe can manage this particular challenge. I'm not going to go through it because it would take too long, but uh, it is something that we can no longer afford to ignore. Um, having said that, I do believe that um, the fate of humanity depends on our getting the non-proliferation thing correct. I am a strong believer in global zero. I believe that Pre President Obama was a strong believer in global zero, but he changed towards the end of his uh, mandate, and we are in a critical situation right I just point out um, that on the issue of, of nuclear threat, obviously, as you mentioned, uh, the United States is very engaged on the Iran issue, on the North Korea issue, and on uh, non-proliferation more broadly, uh, including in, in uh, counterterrorism efforts and the concerns there uh, about nuclear as well as uh, uh, other weapons of, of mass destruction, chemical, uh, that we've seen very recently. But we recently released uh, the nuclear um, uh, review the uh, um, uh, nuclear posture review, uh, which was a, a first and a, and a new and important document, which wasn't perhaps widely understood or well reported on as, as these technical things can often be, but I would commend to you uh, reading the review. It's, it's in a fairly, uh, uh, even I could understand it, so it's fairly uh, basic. And it was something that uh, we found as we briefed uh, allies uh, on the review uh, about our nuclear posture, um, they welcome. They welcome the, the openness, the transparency, the discussion about it. Uh, if I could sum it up, I think the view is, look, nuclear weapons are 
part of our arsenal. They're part of, of deterrence. Uh, they're there, and so we want to make sure uh, that, that the posture of them has has been reviewed and, and updated and, and modernized uh, to the to the appropriate uh, level. You know, this is, many of these weapons have been around for a long, long time, and part of what President Trump has actually uh, looked at or his administration is just reviewing and making sure that, that our nuclear posture, our nuclear deterrent is, is appropriate, is, uh, is not outdated, uh, because it is a part of, of our arsenal and our, our strategy. Uh, so I just commend to you that, uh, that report, as I think it's, it's useful to read and, and sort of enlightening. Thank you. Uh, because we're running out of time, maybe one or two very brief questions. Uh, the lady in the back, please. Hello, my name is Genka Gugiv. I'm uh, the director of EU policies and institutions in the foreign ministry. Thank you for the, my, for the invitation uh, to me to participate in this event. And as Bulgaria is now in the role of the rotating presidency of the council, my question is linked to one of our priorities, the Western Balkans. Um, we have been arguing that the Western Balkans is an indispensable part of the new uh, European uh, project and how do you see the inclusion of the Western Balkans in this new EU defense identity through new projects, opening projects for them through the battle groups, uh, through more training and dialogue, just some of the ideas that we have been discussing in the foreign ministry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone would like to start with an answer? Uh, well, it's, uh, I would just reiterate what I was saying. I think maybe the others could, could add some more, more detail. Uh, we, we, uh, let me say how much we appreciate uh, the fact that the Bulgarian presidency has turned uh, Western Balkans as one of their priorities. It makes sense, <laughs> regardless of how you, you look at it, strategically, regionally, uh, politically. And uh, it did have a certain effect. Uh, yes, the focus was predominantly in other areas, uh, but you know the good thing about being uh, about lagging behind is that you can change a bit uh, easier to the changing environment. So if, if there is more of a defense cooperation within the European Union, I think that the countries uh, that were slower uh, in terms of integration uh, might be able to be the first. Uh, in, in adjusting, and uh, we have worked very hard, uh, of course, with, with some of the EU member states on improving our interoperability within NATO, but uh, actually the more you talk uh, with EU member states as well about training, about um, joint threats, uh, the more we see that there, there are parallels, and uh, we have been uh, very active also in the area of regional cooperation because uh, we, we see that uh, there is no reason to, to talk about you know, the role of the EU in dealing with the Balkans, the responsibility of the EU, and then to forget your own responsibility to, to, to uh, try and increase the links and the cooperation uh, within the region. And I, I, I do believe that uh, especially some of the countries in the Balkans have managed to show a different identity in foreign relations as well uh, that hasn't been typical uh, towards the Balkan, and I will commend uh, the agreement between Bulgaria and Macedonia. And uh, uh, I have to say that we have managed uh, in less than two months of negotiations to show that the two countries can act in a very European way and try to bridge differences that we have been struggling with for years and which have made our relationship in many areas, including defense, very difficult. Uh, starting from the agreement that was reached last year, in, in less than several months, we have uh, increased our trade, if I'm not mistaken, 15%. We have increased our level of defense cooperation on trainings, especially in equipment that we actually share. It's old, it, can, it, should, be, it should be renewed, it should be modernized, but while we're having it, we might as well profit from sharing some of the capabilities. And uh, we have moved very much on, on uh, having joint uh, training uh, and exercises. So uh, we believe the time has come not only for you to embrace the region, but also the region to embrace its own responsibility. 
Thank you very much. And a very last question from the gentleman. Okay, Colonel Dur, uh, former head of a section in NATO structure and current uh, Turkish military attaché. Just my question will be quite brief about the uh, possible uh, focus of EU defense identity as uh, uh, from a uh, decision making perspective, uh, whether focusing uh, on protective, preventative, proactive uh, measurement, focusing on uh, monitoring the possible problematic area and uh, interfere uh, before they turn into be a real problem or uh, interfere uh, with, uh, with the problem as they arise uh, getting a, uh, a bigger problem uh, uh, and getting higher uh, risk for the security of the uh, region. Of course, uh, both are equally important, but uh, in, from my perspective, focus should be on one of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the question is for everyone, or do you prefer a specific? Actually, for those who, who believe about defense identity. Mm -hmm. Please. Focusing on preventative, proactive measurement in order to monitor and detect the problematic area and interfere before they in turn into a real problem for the security of the region, okay. or uh, uh, interfere the uh, uh, re uh, crimes we understood it. It's, after it's it arises and be a real problem for the security of the region. Of Thank course, you. they are both equally important. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, we, we agree. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, conflict prevention is in the DNA of the European Union. I mean, the whole point about right. CSDP, and if you look at the CSDP structures, they're predominantly geared to conflict prevention. So it's about early warning. Um, diplomacy, uh, first and foremost. But of course, I mean, I don't think you have a serious, you're not a serious defense actor unless you're prepared, first of all, to engage in prevention. And as I said, if you read every document, if you look at most of the work that's con uh, continued by inst various institutions in Brussels at the EU level, even there in their DNA, it's all about conflict prevention. Of course, we understand the logic very, very well. It's better to deal with a crisis if you can before it, it turns into a full-blown crisis. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes not. But the general point of it being in the, in the, the DNA of the European Union, I think is, is uh, undisputable. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And with this final statement, I'm gonna close the second panel, the second session of today's conference.